Fall and Ash had been hired on at Augmentation Concepts as a lead technician only a year earlier, and so this was quite an important project for him to have been given to head, a project that might propel his career. For the most part, Augmentation Concepts worked with the healthcare industry, creating ponies, as the slang went, mechanical bodies for mutants who had been born without limbs or for severely compromised accident victims. But the company also created cybernetic bodies for non-human races, and these were always lucrative contracts. Until being outfitted by augmentation concepts with a mechanical body that enabled them to interact effectively in a humanoid-orientated environment like Punk Town, the putty-like extra-dimensional race, called the Lillouet, had formerly been required to remain inside a small life-support container, manually carried about by a hired human aid. Similarly, members of the insect-like race, known as the Mihai, small as termites, had been accidentally squashed underfoot on a number of occasions, until human-sized mechanical bodies had been custom-designed for them, which could be piloted by one creature, while a whole tribe of his fellows came along for the ride. But Fallon was still grateful that he hadn't been part of those particular success stories. Precisely because they were so far removed from the human form, both races seemed to hold the humanoid races as inferior, both nearly having been deported from the city of Punktown, and banned from Oasis and the other Earth colonies' worlds altogether, for criminal activity. The Lillouette had been accused of a number of murders, sacrificing individuals as part of a religious ritual. While several groups of Mihai had integrated their resinous nests with human victims, who served as both host and nourishment, their respective embassies had apologised for these embarrassments, and removed the offending individuals back to their own worlds, and all had been forgiven as a cultural misunderstanding. All apologies aside, Fallon had no desire to work in any capacity with beings who might view him and his species as little more than a kind of livestock. Yet he would go into this new project without bias, in the true spirit of a professional, with open arms and an open mind. In touring his client through augmentation concepts, Fallon escorted the liaison of the Ogim race into the spacious, dome-roofed cafeteria that surmounted the building, so as to show off its impressive view of Paxton, the colony city that its inhabitants had taken to calling Punktown. A panoramic view of overwhelmingly discordant architecture, representing countless cultures in addition to that of the indigenous Tume race. The sky peeked through chinks here and there between the buildings, and in a broken patch directly overhead. But it was dark with storm clouds. Rain pelted the dome, ran down its sides in rippling waves, making the city undulate like something illusory. We hold meetings for the employees in here as well, Fallon explained in his pleasant British accent. He had a young, smooth face. His girlfriend Lee said it was a baby face, with his short, bristly hair dyed a vibrant purple, his eyebrows a matching shade. He wore a few conservative piercings, the rings in one ear representing various career awards. His charcoal grey suit was a bit too small for him, but this was a calculated style these days among young executives, to make them look less stuffy and more cute. Lee had picked it out for him. His spectacles, with their thick black frames and green lenses, served multiple uses in his work, but he had taken to wearing them constantly. As long as we're here, Fallon said, would you like to sit down for a bit, grab a coffee or some food? The machines have really excellent fare. No, thank you, Mr. Ash, the liaison said in a deep monotone. Fallon hadn't expected the individual to say yes, he might have taken this entity to be one of the partially human creations the coleopteroid race named the bedbugs used as liaisons. But he had not known it represented the Ogim. Same principle. The Ogim liaison, taller than Fallon by almost a head, wore a heavy rust-coloured cloak that fully concealed its body, and a hood that framed its human face. This face was exceedingly pale, 
its flesh slack and doughy, the small dark eyes as expressionless as the being's voice. A bioengineered organism, perhaps, but more likely a cybernetic creation itself. Shall we resume our tour, then? Fallon said, leading his towering companion back into the corridor outside the cafeteria. As they walked, the Ogim liaison with odd, awkward lurching steps, Fallon went on. Personally, I think our most fascinating success was providing bodies for the guests, as they refer to themselves. Are you familiar with them? No? The guests exist in another dimension, but unlike other extra-dimensional races, they have no means by which to enter our plane physically. So we designed a mechanical body with a blank encephalon mind, a biogen organ, for them to project their consciousness into remotely. It allows them to interact in our dimension quite admirably. Yes, this is akin to our needs, the liaison droned. But in our case, the brains will be provided by us for you to implant into your puppet devices. So, are these Biogen computers for encephalon-powered robots? Fallon asked. Or are they Ogim brains? He had no idea what the Ogim's natural form was. We will concern ourselves with those matters, the liaison said evasively, staring ahead, not looking at Fallon. It hadn't once looked directly at him. It appeared to see without seeing. Fallon forced himself not to take offence. Of course, we won't involve ourselves any more than you direct us to be. At whatever point you want us to turn the work over to your team, you just indicate. This is your show. Indeed, said the liaison, barely moving its bloodless lips. Thank you, Mr. Ash. I am at your service. Fallon said. As they turned toward the shipping department, he casually reached up to his spectacles as if to adjust them on his nose. He depressed a tiny key set into their frames. It was an improper action, no doubt about it, but Fallon could no longer resist. He told himself it was merely scientific curiosity. The twin screens of his lenses now filtered out the shapeless flowing cloak to reveal the body lurching along beside him. It was not a mechanical framework enshrouded within that robe, Fallon was surprised to find, but an entirely organic one. A pinkish crustaceous figure walking on two jointed legs, but with a series of pincer-tipped upper limbs tucked against its thorax. Two of the arthropod's upper limbs filled the cloak's sleeves, and wore gloved appendages that masqueraded as human hands. Fallon's lenses didn't allow him to see through the mock human head, however, to view the creature's natural head. He was left to wonder if that human head was a clever synthetic creation, or, somehow and more repulsively, something that was also organic itself. Fallon was determined not to allow the creature's true appearance to stir his mistrust. That would be wrong, and he would be little better than the superior Lillouette and Mihai whom he had felt so critical of, though he couldn't help but wonder why the being thought it must perpetuate such a deception, in a world it already seemed sufficiently adapted to deal with. Did it think so little of him, that it believed he would feel more at ease interacting with a human face? Actually, stealing another glance at that dead-eyed countenance, Fallon would have preferred the opposite. Work on the Ogim Commission proceeded smoothly, and thus swiftly. Fallon's superiors were quite pleased with him. His girlfriend Lee, who had been his team leader at a former job, was pleased with his mounting success, and hence less likely to leave him, despite the troubles that all young couples faced. Basically, he had never been more pleased with himself in his adult life. Not to say that he didn't find the Ogim troubling from time to time, or perhaps always troubling, but he hadn't wanted to admit to it, not to himself, and surely not to any of his team or management, lest it reflect badly upon him. 
Fallon had been designated Research and Development Bay 5 in which to set up shop for the project. He led a team of 12 technicians, and every few days anywhere from one to three Ogeem representatives came in to inspect their progress and familiarise themselves with the technology being devised for them. For all Fallon knew, twenty different Ogeem might have visited the facility by now, just taking turns wearing the same three human masks, which were almost identically bland and lifeless. One day, a day on which a trio of Ogeem were present, a petite, attractive tech named Padma leaned close to Fallon and whispered, Who do you think they killed to get those faces? Fallon glanced around quickly to be certain no one, particularly an Ogim, was near enough to hear them, and scolded Padma. Shh, don't say that. I'm sure they grew them or something. Are you sure? she asked. And who do they think they're fooling anyway, wearing those get-ups? They look like they're ready to go trick-or-treating. Padma, please now. We have to respect their cultural beliefs or, or practices or what have you. For all we know, they might consider it disrespectful to interact with another race without trying to appear like them. Or it could be a very old instinct of self-preservation to try to blend in with other creatures who aren't like them, and they're just following their nature. You don't think they could simply be sneaky by nature? Fallon straightened up and made his tone more officious. Padma, I'm sorry, but that'll be enough of that. This is punk town. It's not like we aren't familiar with alien races here. And this is augmentation concepts, where we don't discriminate against workers or clients. Okay. Sorry, Fallon, Padma muttered, turning back to her work. Fallon hated confrontation of any kind, but with greater responsibility came greater responsibility. He glanced about further to locate the trio of Ogim and spotted their tall, robed forms huddled around an object floating in a clear tank filled with a greenish, faintly luminous solution. He moved to join them. Gentlemen, he greeted them, not knowing even if the Ogim had distinct genders. I see you're just about ready for us to integrate the first of your test encephalons. Bioengineered human brain tissue that served as organic computers had been widely used for years now by Earth's own people. But usually this tissue was spread out almost flat in what was called a brain frame. The Ogim's encephalon, however, looked precisely like a human brain in shape and size. Wires trailed from it like unravelling nerves as it rested at the bottom of the burbling tank. A loud buzz issued from the parted lips of one of the three pallid faces. Fallon was startled and almost took a step back. All around, technicians looked up sharply. The Ogim made a phlegmy sound like it was clearing its throat and then spoke. Excuse me. It cleared its throat again. Ah, yes, Mr. Ash, we feel we are ready for the first tests along those lines. We will oversee your introduction of the brain into the armature. However, you are to be certain that the speech apparatus that would normally allow the brain to generate audio will not be engaged for this test or any other to follow. Fallon shrugged. As you wish. To be Honest, since this is new technology and security is not yet assured, we wouldn't want to inadvertently transmit information that could be considered confidential by our governing body. 
Yes, of course, I understand. Fallon smiled to put them at ease. Still, he would be lying to himself if he didn't wonder what it was the Ogin were afraid he or his team might overhear. Could augmentation concepts be inadvertently supplying technology to a future enemy? It wasn't as though that had never happened before in the history of humankind, even prior to intergalactic colonization. He couldn't repress a mental image of an army of cybernetic soldiers waging war in the streets of Punktown, commanded by minds such as this one, resting in its aquarium like a brain coral. Oh, so, the liaison continued in its sepulchral tone. During the initial tests, we will want the armature's powers of locomotion disabled, so it can be more easily controlled until we are assured of its safety. Well, but if you don't want it to walk and move around, how can you tell if the encephalon's integration and your subsequent programming are successful? All in good time, Mr. Ash. We will first monitor the brain's response to simple commands. We will ask you to permit only the use of its arms and hands for the preliminary test. As you wish, Fallon repeated. Again he shrugged. After all, he was merely the tool to implement their desires, and they the tool to implement his paycheck. Their desires? Had he really thought of it in those words? It made him feel like a prostitute. Riding home on the subway that evening, after putting in an extra hour of work on the Ogin project, Fallon Ash, as always, kept an eye on his fellow passengers peripherally, while ostensibly staring across the aisle at his own reflection in the opposite window. A few years ago, he had been violently mugged in a park by a mutant junkie high on purple vortex. A group of Walker's youths, probably a gang, were seated a short distance away, all of them humanoid native tomb, with mouths extending back to their ears. Several times Fallon had started to doze, his head dropping, and the youths had loudly feigned snoring. One of them had puckered his mouth small, too, obviously to imitate Fallon's earthly features, inciting the others to laughter. Fallon had smiled as if it were all in good fun to mock innocent strangers, but had still avoided looking at any of the youths. There were gangs that would kill you for making direct eye contact, considering it a challenge. As it drew nearer to his stop, the train emerged from the underground into the variegated light of night in the open city. The weather had been good today, the air outside warm and pleasant. Maybe there would be time for him and Lee to take a little walk around the safe shopping district close to their apartment. Perhaps they'd even dine out tonight. He was still in a celebratory frame of mind. Glancing around more actively now that there was more to see outside the windows, and restless as his stop approached, for the first time Fallon noticed a figure seated toward the end of this particular car. A man in a bulky raincoat, despite the weather, its hood pulled up over his head, obscuring his face so that only the end of his nose and thin sealed lips were discernible. He seemed to be staring back at Fallon, though it was hard to be sure with his eyes swallowed in shadow. Fallon's heart lurched, or was that just a train pulling to a halt? In a flash he was up out of his seat and nudging along in the line to disembark. On the platform, when those who had been awaiting the train and those vacating it had finished trading places, Fallon turned to scan the windows of the car he had just left. He expected to see a shadowy hooded face peering down at him from one of them, but the city lights glared too brightly on their surfaces, and anyway the train was soon pulling away with a whoosh. He chided himself. What kind of irrational reaction had that been? He started to turn to continue on to his apartment complex on foot, but abruptly stopped. Sitting on a bench across the platform from him was the figure from the train, as if waiting for another train. The same heavy raincoat, 
its hood pulled up, regardless of the comfortable weather. This time the entire face was lost to shadow. Gloved hands were folded on the person's lap. Trying to appear casual, Fallon turned away and began walking home. But his heart seemed intent on walking more briskly ahead of him, like a small dog yanking at its leash. He turned a corner and immediately glanced back to see if he were being followed. By the time he reached his building and let himself into his vestibule, he'd glanced behind him a half dozen times more. Before proceeding to the elevator, Fallon stared out through the glass of the vestibule's door. But the figure didn't appear out there on the sidewalk. Fucking hell, Fallon said shakily to himself. He was being foolish, surely. What reason would the Ogim have for following him? Was he now so unreasonably and unfairly distrustful of the Ogim, so unaccountably unnerved by them, that he no longer even trusted the faces of his fellow humans? Next, he told himself, he'd be jumping at his own reflection. Even still, as he stepped into the empty elevator, he half expected to see a hooded figure slip in after him, just before the doors could close. It doesn't seem right, confided small, brown-skinned Padma. Fallon had found himself thinking he would ask her out if Lee ever broke up with him. Not that he wanted that. Lee was primarily of Asian ancestry, Padma of Indian ancestry, and he admitted to himself that he was most attracted to non-white women. But he had never dated any of the more humanoid non-Earth races, such as the Tum, Tikihotos, Kalians, or Sinanese. Padma went on. They're asking us not to monitor their experiments here in our own facility. If they want to do that, shouldn't they do it on their own world? Or at least rent their own space here in the city. We don't know what they might do in Bay 5. Padma, Fallon sighed. I'm sure they won't do anything disruptive or dangerous. They're only utilising the technology that we've designed for them, and that they've paid for. But if so, why not let us, or at least you, be present for the tests? What are they trying to hide, Fallon? Maybe they're just wary of the Earth colonies. We are a bit intimidating, you know. Their world isn't in our network. What is their world, anyway? Yugoth, Fallon said. Apparently, it's an extra-dimensional world, contaminous with Pluto. Anyway, shouldn't we at least have some cameras on when we turn Bay 5 over to them? Padma persisted. Surely it's not inappropriate of us to operate our own security cameras? Padma, we agreed not to monitor them in any way, as a condition in the contract. What is it you have against the Ogim, anyway? The tech averted her eyes, looking frustrated about putting her feelings into words. Maybe it's the way they talk to each other when we aren't beside them. That buzzing sound. I swear it gets into my mind and crawls around in there for hours after I hear it. She lifted her intent gaze to him again. And what do they want our armatures for, anyway? They don't need them themselves. What are they going to program into those encephalons? Not to mention that their encephalons don't look bioengineered. What do you mean? They don't look grown, Fallon, Padma hissed. They look harvested. To occupy himself on the afternoon of the Ogim's first tests with the construct that housed their encephalon, to distract himself from his vague unease, Fallon closed himself away in his own tiny office. Lee was more easygoing than himself, or maybe more hardened, having lived in Punktown longer than he. Either way, she had once snidely remarked that he suffered from what she called an excess of dismay. And so, for the sake of their relationship, he had been making an effort not to indulge that dismay, part of that effort being to avoid the news. After all, the news in Punktown was just a daily parade of atrocities. 
including too many vids of bloody crimes and bloody accidents, caught on security cams or on the wrist comps of witnesses, who then posted the vids on the net. But today, in his office, and in need of distraction to take his mind off the experiments in Bay 5, Fallon found himself idly flipping through news stories on his computer. Sure enough, the usual buffet of suffering. But one story jumped out at him, and he lingered. Last night, a renowned professor of extraterrestrial anthropology and folklore at Paxton University, Arthur Gregg, had been found dead in his apartment. Something of an eccentric, apparently, the controversial professor had lately been having personal troubles and conflicts with the school, supposedly attributable to stress he was undergoing in researching a book he was much obsessed with. Greg's death couldn't have been a suicide, however, owing to the state of the body. While the cause of death was as yet undetermined, the professor's skull had been opened by an unknown assailant and his entire brain removed from the crime scene. In reaching for his coffee, Fallon inadvertently overturned it. He scurried to impatiently clean up the mess. When he was able to return to his chair and the article, he found that there had been a similar crime a few months earlier, leading authorities to consider the possibility of a serial killer. In that earlier case, Fallon read, a brilliant researcher into the study of alternate dimensions and extra-dimensional communication and travel, Robert Beers, had also been found dead in his home, again with his brain removed. This time Fallon recognised the man's name. Beers was an outside researcher brought in on contract when Augmentation Concepts had been devising the remotely controlled encephalon and its cybernetic carriage for the beings known as the guests. Why would a killer want the brains of such people? the article asked. Might the perpetrator be keeping them as a kind of trophy? or even cannibalising them. One interviewed police investigator postulated that the killer was perhaps a failed and embittered academic. Fallon tapped at a holographic keyboard floating above his desk, then brushed the air with little strokes of his fingertips, whilst his other hand impatiently swept intervening windows away as if shooing a persistent fly. Within seconds he had reactivated the security cameras in Bay 5, but in such a way that the central security desk should not be aware of his actions, nor able to access the reactivated cameras themselves. Several monitor screens now hung in the air in front of his face, but he pulled the best view to the fore and enlarged it. The camera revealed the three Ogeen representatives in their rust-coloured robes, surrounding the roughly anthropomorphic armature the company had created for them. The organ had already been removed from its aquarium and implanted in the clear upper skull of the construct. A weird buzzing filled Bay 5 as the Ogim conversed animatedly, and Fallon remembered Padma's remarks about this. He could understand her sentiments. The sound seemed to skitter through the convolutions of his own brain like a swarm of centipedes. The armature was seated in one of the office chairs, its legs completely disabled, as had been requested. Fallon had seen to this himself. It almost looked like a prisoner bound to a chair to be interrogated. And then, the buzzing he heard next was apparently a command for the organic mind to become active, to awaken, as it were. Maybe even a command for it to move the construct's arms, for this was what happened. Both the cybernetic carriage's arms flew up and whipped about madly, reminding a startled Fallon of a person gone into a panic, drowning, or falling from a great height. One of the arms accidentally struck one of the Ogim, sending it stumbling back a few steps. No, Fallon realised, it hadn't been an accident. The construct's arms were very clearly reaching out to strike at the Ogim, the fingers trying to snatch hold of their cloaks. The other two Ogim had moved back out of the range of the frenzied limbs as well. More buzzing, as the Ogim seemed to bark more orders at the mechanical entity, but it was either incapable of complying, or refused to become subdued. It's afraid, 
Fallon whispered to himself. He understood the thing's feelings perfectly well. He was afraid, too. As frightened and appalled as he was, Fallon still came to a quick determination. His hands once more went through the sharp, sure motions of a master orchestra conductor. He accessed certain stations in Bay 5 remotely, and opened up their controls and monitors before him. These holographic apparitions tinted amber to differentiate them from the green tint of his virtual desktop computer. Anger had been aroused in him as well as fear, and he was tempted to grant the construct an unrestricted range of movement so that it might fly up out of its chair and give its oppressors a surprise. Instead, though, he had decided to access the machine's powers of vocalising the encephalon's thoughts. He must do so, however, in such a way that only he could hear these vocalizations in his private office. A few last keystrokes, and suddenly a loud agitated voice erupted in Fallon's office. He scrambled awkwardly to decrease the volume. In so doing, he touched a few wrong ghostly keys, but finally got the volume reduced. The voice sounded synthetic, but more emotive than the voices of the Ogim themselves had ever been and what the voice shouted was, "'Bastards! Demons! You're demons! You think I'll cooperate with you? You think I'll help you do your evil? You think I'll help you talk with those gods of yours?' Fallon leaned closer to the ambery controls and said, "'Professor Gregg, is that you? Or is that you, Mr. Beers? Hello, can you hear me?' Then Fallon witnessed something unexpected in the security camera's monitors. Simultaneously all three Ogim liaisons straightened up and turned this way and that, until their scrutiny settled on one security camera in particular, up by the ceiling, and they turned to face it in unison. Three sets of glassy, unblinking eyes glared directly at Fallon, seeming to bore straight into his skull. Fucking hell, he hissed under his breath. He had successfully directed the encephalon's vocalizations so that only he would hear them. But he had accidentally enabled his own responses to be heard throughout Bay 5. Hello! called the encephalon's artificial voice. Is someone there? Who is that? Help me, will you? For God's sake, help me! But Fallon Ash's frightened reaction was to reach up and flick his fingers at the air, as if speaking in sign language, and he swept his hands to brush the ectoplasmic computer terminals away. Gone were the controls that gave him access to the prototype construct. Gone were the security camera monitors. Gone the panicky, pleading voice. Gone the angry buzzing of the Ogim, though, like an echo, the centipedes still swarmed through his brain. Possible links between the two men were being sought. To his dismay, Fallon Ash believed he might already know a link. Fallon fled augmentation concepts. Fled was the only word. Fled in something like raw panic, but was afraid to go home, lest the Ogim follow and find out where he lived. Or did they already know? Had that truly been one of them that night, wanting to see where he lived in advance, in case he found out too much about them. Maybe they had perceptibly assessed him, he thought, intuitively recognised that he was one who might pose a problem, no matter how well he had sought to mask the revulsion he felt for them. He took a train to the Canberra Mall instead, and only then, wandering safely in a crowd of strangers, did he use his wrist comp to call his supervisor and explain he had gone home early? He mumbled something about feeling nauseous. It wasn't really a lie. Along the way to the mall, he had debated his course of action. Should he go directly to the authorities to report what he'd seen, what he'd put together? Or should he go to the Ogim himself, apologise for having eavesdropped on them? Maybe he could even claim it had been an accident and assure them he meant to cause no problems. It was cowardly. Oh, he knew it was cowardly. But it was such an incredible career booster, heading this commission. Having wandered up and down various levels of Punktown's largest mall, he finally stopped in front of one great display window, 
staring through his ghostly reflection at a trio of male mannequins in beautiful five-piece business suits, such as he had always fantasized about wearing one day, without feeling self-conscious about it, without feeling undeserving. They were automaton mannequins, changing their poses in a programmed cycle. They seemed to make eye contact with him, and smiled at him ambiguously. Standing there before his reflection superimposed over the central mannequin, he lifted his arm and called his company again on his wrist comp, as if striking a business-like pose himself. Reaching a kind of unhappy medium, he had decided to report what he had witnessed to his supervisor, and see what augmentation concepts thought was the best way to address these alarming revelations. In the office of Fallon's immediate supervisor, her son, he repeated the entire story, but this time in the presence of the Director of Research and Development Operations. Marcus Broom Marcus Broom, with his broad body expertly fitted in a five-piece suit. No cute, too small suit for him. Fallon tried not to let his voice quaver, tried not to gesture so much, but his hands seemed to flap nervously in the air of their own volition. He felt like a marionette in the hands of an amateur. At last, when he had finished, Marcus Broom, maintaining his equilibrium much better than Fallon had, occupying his chair with the density of a collapsed star, drilled his gaze into Fallon and asked, Did you at any time actually hear the voice identify itself as this Professor Arthur Gregg? or as Robert Beers. Well, no, it, it didn't. Did it at any time actually state that it was a mind removed from a human being, as opposed to a biogen organ? It didn't say that, no, but, but it expressed great, um, dismay, sir, dismay, and said it refused to cooperate, refused to help them talk to their gods, something to that effect. Yes, you said that. And does that sound like rational talk to you? Fallon, this was the very first test of a biogen organ created by outside technology, integrated with a cybernetic construct of our design. You should know by now that until all the bugs are worked out, all types of quirky behaviours can occur. What you heard was just a bit of gibberish, we're certain. And yet here you are making these very serious accusations. Accusations that could have great repercussions not only for our company, but for the governing body of Punktown as well. Fallon squirmed in his chair. If you'd only heard it, sir. Damn if I'd only recorded it. That voice. It didn't sound like a confused artificial intelligence, but an actual living entity. It was babbling nonsense, Fallon. You might as well look for conspiracies in the ravings of a junkie sitting on the floor of a subway station. Do you have any idea how important this contract is to augmentation concepts? Of course I do, sir. Fallon, Hassan cut in, in his milder if no more sympathetic tone. We spoke with your game about this before you arrived and... You told them about me? Fallon broke in horrified. Well, you wanted us to look into this, didn't you? Broom replied. Anyway, they already recognised it was your voice over the speaker. Her son continued. Fallon, don't worry. The Ogim are very understanding about all this. In fact, they asked us to apologise to you on their behalf. They're sorry if they seemed excessively secretive about their intent. They're not asking us to produce anything threatening, because you know we'd never agree to that. All they wanted was an ambulatory vessel to house their biogen computers. That would also protect the encephalons through the process of extra-dimensional travel. To Fallon, Hassan's words sounded rehearsed. Did he truly believe them himself? We've been very happy with your performance, Fallon, Broom resumed, softening a tad, now sounding like a stern but understanding school principal. Maybe you've overworked yourself, and the stress became a bit much. The Ogim's tests went well, we're told, and the project is ready to go into its final phase. Production of 14 more models like this for the Ogim to bring back home with them, with the possibility of more units being ordered down the road. Now, I'd hate to have to remove you from the project at this point, 
and give you something else beneath your abilities. Do you think you can get it together a little, so you can continue with things like before? Fallon looked down at his hands, knotted uncomfortably in his lap like mating spiders, or spiders locked in a battle to the death. He thought of Lee, so pleased with him. He thought of mannequins wearing five-piece suits. Yes, sir, he said almost inaudibly. It was easier for him over the next several weeks that the Ogim were all but absent from Bay 5. Only in the last few days, when the fourteen new cybernetic armatures were ready to receive their encephalon mines, did the extra-dimensional beings return to take over operations. At that time, Fallon saw them wheel in a large tank atop a tray on wheels. Within this tank, filled as it was with greenish amniotic fluid, were a whole crop of pale knotted brains, thin wires trailing from them and wavering in the solution like sea plants. He had tried not to watch the news on VT or read news stories on the net during these weeks, but it seemed he just couldn't stop himself. Police reported that they were still on the trail of the serial killer whose strange and gruesome modus operandi was to remove the brains of his victims, the bodies of thirteen more humans, both male and female, and an odd mix of researchers, scholars, and other people who had excelled in their realms of expertise, had shown up all over the great megalopolis of Paxton and in the not-too-distant neighbouring city of Miniosis, their skulls just empty vessels. At the close of the final day, before the Ogim would return to their own world of Yugoth, with their troop of fifteen cybernetic armatures, Fallon felt disinclined to impart any obligatory pleasant goodbyes, so he disappeared into the restroom in the hallway outside Bay 6. Bay 6 was currently disused except for disorganised storage, and he didn't expect anyone to bother him there. Sitting in one of the restroom stalls, he glanced at the time on his wrist comp. It was past five. Surely it was safe to return to Bay 5 now, and close down for the night, and for the weekend. Maybe he and Lee would go out tonight to celebrate that it was all over. Washing his hands at the row of sinks, he looked up at the large vid screen which, unlike a mirror, flipped the image of the viewer so one saw oneself as others did. He caught the eye of the man washing his hands clean and held his gaze, contemplating the funny notion that in a natural reflection a person never saw himself as he truly was. It was while staring almost distrustfully, almost disapprovingly, at this doppelganger that he noticed the restroom's door opening soundlessly behind him. Fallon turned around more quickly than he'd intended, and a tall figure draped in a rust-coloured hooded robe like some sort of cultist, passed into the restroom with unnatural steps. Close behind it, a second and then a third robed figure entered the restroom, and there stood all three of the Ogim, stood between Fallon and the restroom door. Suddenly he regretted his decision to hide himself in this lonely section of the large structure. So, here you are, Mr. Ash said the figure in the centre. It was apparently, at least, the same being whom Fallon had toured through the facility on the very first day, though it was hard to tell one blank human face from another, and he had never learned the name of any of them. We were looking for you. Yes, yes, Fallon chirped with an uneasy chuckle. I'm so sorry. It's time for you to leave Punktown, isn't it? It is, said the dead, uninflected voice. We wanted to be sure we had thanked you sufficiently for all your services. Oh, well, he made a brushing motion. That's my job, isn't it? A job well done. We won't soon forget you, Mr. Ash. Ah, yes, thank you. You have impressive skills. Much knowledge in certain areas. A man like you could go far. 
Go far, echoed another of the Ogin. Ah, uh, said Fallon. Perhaps one day, the apparent leader intoned, we will see you again. We may have future use of your skills. The looming figure slowly pivoted back toward the restroom door. The other two preceded it out, but in the threshold it looked back and added, Further use of that clever mind of yours. For the first time since Fallon had known any of them, he saw a smile come to the Ogim's waxen visage. In his dream, the dream that came repeatedly, Lee would lean down over the table toward him, lean towards the vessel, and peer in through its glass at him. Somehow he could see her. His mind must be connected to various sensory apparatuses via the wires that trailed from him, bobbing in the greenish fluid. He could see Lee's lovely face, framed in curtains of black hair, staring in at him. A small, mysterious smile would come to her waxen visage, but below that lovely face, from the neck down, was a pinkish exoskeleton standing on two jointed legs, with a series of pincer-tipped upper limbs extending from its thorax. Lee's long, inky hair spilled over hard, knobbly shoulders of chitin. His mind, his brain in a bottle of gurgling amniotic solution, would scream then, scream through a speaker to which it was also wired, and the smile on Lee's stolen head would only grow wider. But Lee would always wake him from this dream, coo to him and calm him, soothe him in her groggy voice and urge him to sleep again. She was patient and sympathetic, though he had not shared with her the reason for his dreams, or their true subject matter. Fallon Ash would gradually fall asleep again, somewhat relieved to find that it wasn't really his stolen brain that was crying out, only his conscience.'